The first scripture reading is 2 Kings 5, verses 1 through 14. Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who was in Samara, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, with this letter, I am sending my servant Naaman to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me? When Elijah, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he will know that there was a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots, and he stopped at the door of Elijah's house. Elijah sent a message to say to him, Go, wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. I know not about and pop out of the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel. Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Naaman's servants went to him and said, my father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times as the man of God had told him, and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. May God add a blessing to the reading of his holy word. Thank you, Marianne. Hear also these words from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verses 1 through 12. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take pur a purse or bag or sandals, and do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Stay there, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is offered to you. Heal the sick who are there, and tell them the king kingdom of God has come near to you. But when you enter a town and are not welcomed, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town we wipe from our feet as a warning to you, let this be sh let, yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. May God 
blessings be added to the hearing and understanding of these holy words. As we strive to understand them and how they apply to our daily lives. I've always had to chuckle a little when I read the story of Naaman, the mighty warrior, whose image is weakened by a loathsome case of bad skin. He goes off to battle with his leprosy. I mean, he goes off to battle his leprosy, carrying with him enough money to pay for a couple of heart and lung transplants, a pair of new kidneys, and a complete cosmetic makeover. But when he arrives, Elisha's nurse practitioner gives him the 9th century BCE equivalent of take two aspirins and call again in the morning. Naaman is obviously nonplussed. He can't even buy a cure. He can't even get past the receptionist to see the healer for a direct personal diagnosis. Naaman, the great, wealthy commander of the army of the king of Aram, loaded down with enough armor to wage a mighty battle against his bothersome case of bad skin, he finds himself with nothing that can win his cure. He is told to go. Wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh will be restored and you shall be clean. It's too simple. It's not difficult enough for a person like Naaman. Where's the fight? Where's the valor? Where's the bravery in this battle? It's just too simple. Take a bath every day for a week. I know my granddaughter would fight that, but... Naaman can't accept the prescription, and he goes away in anger. I can remember a time when I put off going to a doctor because I didn't think I had the time to find out why I was feeling so dreadfully tired and run down. I also put off going because I feared that I was carrying some dread disease which would require some complicated, expensive, drawn-out cure. So when I finally mustered the courage and gumption to go, I, like Naaman, was rather let down. When I was literally told, take two aspirin, go to bed, eat a well-balanced meal, and treat my body kindly for one whole week, I was disgusted with myself for spending money for a medical prescription which I could have gotten from my mother. But in fact, this simple care cure was all I really needed. I needed someone to tell me of my very simple need in the midst of my very complex style of living to take care of myself. So easy. No great battle. Sometimes it's hard to appreciate the victory without the glory of an incredible win. But neither Naaman nor I would have followed this too simple advice if it had not been for friends and families who urged us both to try it. After all, We had prepared ourselves for much worse. What harm could come from giving it a try? Swallow our pride. Accept the calm, quiet, soothing, and comforting care. We had to trust in the caring of others. How many of us come to church seeking something that will make a difference in our lives? I once asked someone why they come to this particular church, and the answer was simple. In a complex world where lives are directed and dictated by social security numbers, 
where the specialness of individuals gets lost in the economy of serving masses. Here was a community who cared about each other with a loving appreciation, which allowed one to both give and to receive, to nurture and to be nurtured. We are unable to offer an abundance of programming here. Our resources are basic. Do we offer here a cure which is just too easy? Fellowship, a caring community? Is it just too simple to be graciously received? Jesus said, for where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. There don't have to be great gatherings as long as there is more than one one brought together with another in the name of Christ, in the love of Christ. Then Christ is in our midst, ministering, comforting, empowering, and healing. It's really very basic. And the lesson is as old as the recordings of Genesis. The fullness of creation is experienced in relation to others through whom is revealed our relationship with God. Naaman alone, with all of his powers and gifts, could not bring about his own cure. His servant, his friends, his family, his advisors, all of whom cared about him, they enabled him to receive the cure. Community, being in communion, in common, in communication with others, enables Nathan to receive his cure. That's what we offer here. It's simple. We enable others to trust in, to have faith in, and receive the cure of unconditional acceptance, comfort, and healing which we have come to experience through Jesus Christ. The Luke passage is also about basic truths and tasks that sometimes get lost in the baggage of our life's journey. Our text this morning from Luke 10, but just one chapter back from Luke 10, it is recorded that Jesus sent out his 12 disciples with almost the same instructions that he now commissions the 70. This time, however, Jesus sends them on ahead of him in pairs, two by two, to every town and village where he himself intends to go. When I first read the passage, I wondered, why didn't Jesus maximize the use of his labor force? After all, as a bright and experienced regional sales manager, couldn't he cover more territory between here and Jerusalem if he sends each of the 70 out on their own or each of the 12 out on their own? He even states the harvest is plenty, but the laborers are few. Why does he do that? Why was he not making the best of his time and the resources available to him? Why two by two to places that he intends to go himself? Perhaps Jesus knew that they were traveling through very hostile territory where he and his followers would be vulnerable, as vulnerable as lambs to wolves. Security was a possible rationale for sending out people in twos, more safety in numbers. He probably knew there would be some lonely times out there. Doors could be shut. Villages might, gates, the gates of villages might be barred. Companionship, being concretely reminded that you're a team player is always an important corporate consideration. It keeps morale up. And when morale is up, production prevails. There's also the increased possibility of success 
through the pooling of resources and talents, camaraderie, safety, and resources. All those three are good reasons for sending them out two by two. It is also an assurance that if one disciple misses an opportunity or misreads a situation, the other will be present to pick up on it. But I think there's at least one more, one even better, easier, more simple, more basic reason that Jesus wasn't sending out commanding warriors like the king of Aram sent Naaman. He wasn't sending out 70 individuals to see how they could do on their own. Jesus said, for where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Those disciples were not going out to win the kingdom of God from wolves for Jesus. They were not going out to bring about the kingdom of God somewhere out there in Samaria and beyond. They were carrying Jesus with them as they went two by two out into the homes that would receive them. They went out carrying the kingdom of God nearer to all who would receive them because they had gone out and Jesus was always there among them. Jesus tells them it's really pretty simple. There will be disappointment and there will be rejection. Let those things go. Keep your eyes on the prize. Let God take care of all those disappointments. Dust them off and go on with your task. You don't need letters of reference. You don't need money. You don't need armor. You don't need pamphlets or tracts. Just have faith that you have been sent there by the Lord, the Lord of the harvest, to bring in his harvest. Go out knowing that you are bringing the good news of the nearness of the kingdom of God through your personal greeting of peace which is the message of my name. The kingdom nears through your personal ministering presence with all who re would receive you. These are the words of Jesus to his disciples. There's a word that we use and sometimes misuse and misunderstand that we in our own culture, and that's the word evangelism. Angelic, bearers of good news. That's what evangelism is. It's so very, very easy. We are working together on our covenant of ministry, which urges us to be intentional bearers of the good news. And when we do that, we help bring the kingdom of God nearer to reigning over all creation. We're not being asked to make this journey alone, out into dangerous territories as heavily armored warriors. We're not asking that you become self-ordained do-gooders. Ministry is a community experience. And mission is fully realized through the support, enrichment, and perseverance of a gathered body ruled by the love and grace of Jesus Christ. God acts in the world, and we have been called to participate in that activity. We are called to go out in the company of at least one other into the daily experiences of those to whom God sends us, caring for their needs and reminding them that we live in a redeemed world where forgiveness is available. We don't need to bring magic into their lives. What we have been called to do is so easy. Perhaps, like Naaman's pure, it's too easy. 
And we end up making it complicated to feel that we're really doing something wonderfully faithful. Our task is to go out and share the difference that following Jesus can make in people's lives by evidencing a genuine care, by being servants to one another, by simply being present for one another and for the stranger among us. For when we serve one such as these, Jesus reminds us, we are serving him. We aren't called to be miraculous healers. That's what Jesus does. We aren't called to be warriors. We've been called to be carriers. We're carriers of the good news, which we have already received. And the comfort clause is that we're not carriers alone. It's a community endeavor. Let's, let's not make something so basic to who we are into something so difficult to do. Remember the story of Naaman. Amen.